This is One on One. Charles Selengut is author of Sacred Fury, Understanding Religious Violence, and a professor of sociology at County College of Morris. Good to see you, Charles. Hi. Uh, violence and religion, and people engage in all sorts of violence in uh, the name of religion. We are uh, doing this program after the bombing in Boston. Is that an example of what we're talking about? I think so. All religions have messages of peace and love, but they also have prescriptions for violence against those people's governments, other religions they consider uh, evil or dangerous to their own thinking. And there's, there's no one religious group that engages in this. I mean, there are some folks who call themselves Christian um, who, in fact, can justify or do justify the bombing of an abortion clinic or, or the killing of uh, a physician who happens to in, uh, perform an abortion and say they're doing it in the name of Christianity because they believe a certain thing about abortion, correct? Correct. Is that the same thing? That is an example of religious violence. And it's important to realize that the, the actual number of people who actually commit violence are very few. Mm. But there are hundreds, sometimes hundreds of thousands, of supporters who themselves will not engage in violence, but they aid a bit. You mentioned the abortion, those yes. killers of abortion doctors the, in Rochester and upstate New yes. York. These people didn't, this man didn't act alone. He had safe houses, money, he had associates in Europe. So religious violence doesn't only refer to those people, individuals, mm -hmm. who act, as in the case of Boston. That these acts are never individual. They're always communal. There's always a large network. One of the problems with the media in the West, in Europe and in America, is the refusal to see these violence as communal. It's easy to see these as these third people, sometimes they are, yes. or they're poor. There are bombers as, uh, as Mohammed, uh, as the, the lead bomber in uh, Mohammed Atta, Atta in 9-11, 9-11, who was the graduate of the uh, Hamburg Technical Institute. He won the first prize, but he was aided and abetted by an international group. Across the board, that's the nature of a religious violence. It's the refusal in a kind, it's really a kind of Western ethnocentrism to refuse to recognize that while religion uh, gives many loving and kind mm. and does much good, worked against racial bigotry, works for world peace, there is an element in all religions where violence is legitimated and justified. So here's the question. What is it that we do about this if, in fact, it is less isolated and more pervasive given the aiding and abetting that you described? That's such a wonderful American question. You want the it's solution. American question. That's all I've got. Okay. You know? uh, the first step is real understanding. The problem is that this is not a criminal act. This is not psychological deviance. This, these are people acting in terms of their religious beliefs. It's not a criminal act? No, it's a criminal act, but it's, not, it's absolutely criminal. It's not criminal in the sense that people uh, hold up a 7-Eleven or they murder somebody for money. In that sense, it's not criminal. The, the people themselves who do it believe they're acting for godly and divine purposes. They're really convinced that they're doing the will of God. That's why we have the term holy war. The people who bombed 9-11 really believed they were, they were really helping out their own religious message. How do we know that as opposed to the fact that some believe they just hated Americans? Well, you have to see what they say what they, what, how they interpret their scriptures. In other words, there's a danger. In other words, we have to take people seriously. When people who engage in religious violence say they're acting in the name of religion, who is to say they're not? The, the point I'm trying to make is we can't tell religious people what is their religion. They, they are the ones to define it. Now, uh, mm. certainly the uh, most uh, Christians are, uh, the vast, vast majority of Christians are appalled at these abortion uh, uh, killings, That's of course. Right. Yet, these people themselves believe, honestly, they're doing it. In other words, part of the problem is, Steve, that I was saying before, is that the Western media and even Western academia 
are so secularized, are so removed from religion, that it's very difficult for them to really appreciate that other people in other parts of the world are willing to die for their religion. Fine, so say we accept and understand they're willing to die. You're willing to blow a plane, uh, drive a, a, a fly a plane into a building. You're willing to put a bomb uh, at the finish line at the Boston Marathon. You're willing to kill a doctor who performs a legal abortion in this country. So we understand it. Then what? Then we have to understand where it's coming from. Once we, un we could diagnose the problem, we may m more easily be able to deal with it. But how? The point, if, someone, if someone believes that they have a divine right and a responsibility to do these things and they will be rewarded in some way, tell me where that conversation goes. All we could do is, and is that we take on these people, and this is a war, like a war against Nazism okay. or the war against communism. In other words, they're, they're, what the West has not been able to do in, to this point is precisely to recognize, and that's why I wrote my book, Sacred Fury, to indicate that this fury is, to the, to the perpetrators, sacred, and this is a war. There's no real conversation, though. Do you acknowledge that there is no dialogue that can be had with them? There is a dialogue, I believe. In this, I may be optimistic, but the dialogue has to be only taken by people who can share the religious worldview. In other words, uh, the only people who can deal with, say, the bombers in, in Boston are not uh, secular psychologists, but m moderate Muslims who are themselves very religious, who believe in the message of the Prophet Muhammad, but they would, uh, would be able to point out that this is not the legitimate message. In other words, the question you ask, which is so important and is not asked, and I appreciate it, the dialogue has to be between people who take each other seriously. In other words, if you get a secular person and another secular person, they could agree on religious violence. But that's but it, not the case that's here. Not. You need, the dialogue has to be taken with people who take these people seriously and appreciate their traditions. Uh, Charles Selengate, you've given us so much to think about, um, talk about, and ponder. Sacred fury, understanding, trying to understand religious violence. Please come back again. We'll talk more. Thank you. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Sun National Bank, Qualcare Inc., New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, PSENG, Fedway Associates Inc., the Russell Berry Foundation, and by Cone Resnick. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.